All right, good morning. It is I, J.R., with you, whoever you are, on the town meeting program here on KLAM, sponsored by Cordova Wireless Communications. They are your local cell phone provider, the one that keeps all the money in town, and they provide your local talk program, which has been busy of late because there is much to go over. And we are going to... First, focus on the latest news release, which has got a lot of updated information in it. This is the one from the city and represents the combined wisdom and knowledge, not only of the city, but the incident command team, which is part of the city, but, you know, kind of its own thing, too. And also Ilanka and also Cordova Community Medical Center. And then depending on time... We'll get into some of the things I wanted to get into yesterday for you, but uh, we sort of ran out of time. So we'll see how far we get. And we are going to be adding to our offerings in these pandemic times. I was successful in encouraging the uh, incident command team to let us help with getting information out kind of on a more regular basis. Had a good conversation with them, I guess, a couple days ago. I don't know. All the days mush together now. But at any rate, and and we'll go over this because the new programs are listed in this news release, which, of course, you can read for yourself. If you like to read these things, you can go to cityofcordova.net and uh, download one of these or print it or whatever you prefer. But we're going to start having daily briefings with Mayor Copeland, just quick. And we'll run those uh, 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m. It'll be the same briefing repeated, so we catch more people with it. And then for those of you who like to get your content online, we'll also put it on the YouTube channel Robbie created for our Cordova radio operation. He calls it Cordova TV. Uh, so more on that shortly, but I want to thank the uh, all the city officials who have recognized I mean, they've always known that you want more information. It's just been a process getting to the point that it could get out on a regular basis. Because, again, they have to be very careful what they release efficient, uh, officially to make sure that everything is vetted and legal and, and so on. They don't, they don't just put stuff out on a whim. So I'm really glad that we've gotten to that point, and, of course, we're happy to help out. So let's dive in here to the latest news release. This came out, actually the printout says it came out April 1st, but this one came out April 2nd. So a minor typographical error. This is news release number 11. And the important thing is we still have a zero confirmed positive case count. Got to like that number. First section of this is testing in Cordova. This has been an area of concern for a lot of folks. As of April 2nd, there have been nine COVID-19 tests conducted in Cordova with zero positive results. Between Cordova Community Medical Center and the Alonka Community Health Center, we have the capability to test 300 people in Cordova at this time. More tests have not been administered, because individuals have not been sick enough to meet the CDC guidelines for testing. The number of testing supplies, as well as the lab time to process tests, is limited within the community, the state, and the nation. The city has requested more tests and is exploring every possible avenue to increase testing ability in Cordova, They say, we will update the public as soon as we learn of any changes regarding our ability to test. We talked about this with Clay yesterday when when he and I did our first briefing together, the fact that everybody recognizes the need to do testing, so you get an idea of what's going on in a community. But if they're just testing and testing and testing, they don't have, first of all, they don't have enough tests uh, to make sure that they have some available for people that are definitely showing the symptoms. So people that are just curious if they have it and are asymptomatic, there aren't enough tests to be able to do that. And it's not just the number of tests, but then the analysis. 
there has to be people and time and lab facilities and so forth to actually analyze the tests. And hopefully the technology will continue to improve. Mayor Copeland was talking yesterday about that the, the national news that there are tests that are able to confirm the presence of the novel coronavirus in just a matter of minutes rather than days. How soon we'll be able to get some of those is, is obviously a question, but they are, uh, they're working on it. But again, if you want to review this in print, go to cityofcordova.net and you can read it for yourself. The news release goes on to say the incident management team, which collaborates with our medical professionals and emergency management teams in Cordova and around the state, feel that the curve has been flatter in Alaska and virus incidence has been fairly low because of the social distancing and other steps that the tribes, governments, businesses, organizations, and individuals have put in place to protect themselves and their communities. We cannot emphasize enough how critical it is to continue these practices. Next section of the news release has what's titled, A Message from Cordova's Medical Response Team. So these are our local doctors and nurses and other experts. They say, once a person becomes infected with the virus that causes COVID-19, the usual time before symptoms develop has been shown to be 2 to 11 days, or on average about five and a half days. It's been shown to occur within 14 days. We've learned from other states that the progression of the illness takes time. A person notices they develop one or more symptoms, including dry cough, fatigue, low-grade fever, and sometimes sore throat, body aches, nausea, or diarrhea. These symptoms progress over a period of days. Most people, approximately 80%, that develop these mild symptoms will remain ill with mild to moderate symptoms not requiring hospitalization, lasting for up to two weeks, and then get better. Approximately 20% of those affected with the virus and having initial symptoms may become sicker developing worsening symptoms such as cough and shortness of breath over a matter of days. The best thing to do, our experts go on to say, is to continue social distancing practices and wash your hands regularly and thoroughly. Practice respiratory hygiene such as sneezing or coughing into a tissue or elbow and then immediately wash your hands and do not touch your face. If you develop symptoms, isolate yourself from all others. With mild symptoms, the fever, the dry cough, the fatigue, the best thing to do is to stay home, away from the others in your household, rest, and drink plenty of fluids. If you feel your symptoms are increasing, such as shortness of breath, and you feel the need to come to the emergency department, please call ahead and notify the staff that you are coming so they can be prepared to see you and meet your needs. If you're concerned or have any questions, you can call CCMC at 8000, the CCMC clinic at 8200, or Alonka clinic at 3622. Medical staff will gladly answer your questions and guide you in your care. The medical team goes on now to say there's a lot of concern revolving around this virus Again, the best practice is to continue with social distancing to decrease the chances of getting or giving this virus. The medical facilities are available, but we need to keep from overburdening them so they can care for all the medical needs of the community. There may be some people that become critically ill. In those cases, we have competent staff, doctors, and nurses that are well-trained and qualified to support these critically ill patients. They will provide the critical care necessary to manage the patients with breathing and all other functions until they can be safely transported by medevac to Anchorage. Testing is performed to determine a positive case for means of isolating the person. There are guidelines set by the CDC and the Alaska State Health Department. These guidelines are based on criteria and symptoms, as well as provider decision. 
Both healthcare facilities in Cordova have testing available, and it will be performed based on these CDC guidelines and individual patient health status. The medical response team has been working with the state to prepare and manage our supplies and increase our abilities to effectively care for the community throughout this time. So that concludes the section of this from the medical response team. And by the way, a little later here in the show, we'll talk about some of the the, the turning of the tide toward the use of masks because the the uh, the CDC has been reconsidering its position on that. Originally, they were saying it, it, it don't. It, there's no need to. It's not going to protect you, and we need to save the mass for the medical people. And uh, now they're they're sort of changing some of that. We'll go over that a little later. By the way, this is a good time for me to remind you that if any of you are joining us in the middle of the program uh, here on the radio, it's also going, Robbie will also be archiving it on our Cordova TV YouTube channel, which is Cordova TV slash, no, I'm sorry, it's YouTube.com slash Cordova TV. Now, continuing in the news release, this section is some key information points. And, and these points, by the way, speak to some concerns that are rising to the top as far as actions people think that the city should take regarding the airport and the fishing season. So again, under the heading key information points, number one, the city cannot close the state airport. The federal government and state government have made it clear that they will not allow this. However, the city is working with its partners to screen and monitor those arriving in Cordova, or coming to Cordova, either one. So again, there's been some sentiment from the public, you know, in order for us to try to stay at zero, shut the airport down, don't let anybody come in, and that is not a decision the city is allowed to make. Also, the city says it cannot close the 2020 fishing season, as some people have suggested. Quoting here, the state of Alaska has deemed commercial fishing an industry of critical need to the food chain of the United States and beyond. We do not have the authority to cut off food supply to our country any more than others have the authority to cut off food to Cordova. The city of Cordova IMT, the incident management team, is in daily planning efforts with community partners and stakeholders that are in their own daily planning efforts to protect themselves and their workers. More information on that is below, so we'll be getting to that. And the thing that's interesting about this tidbit is that there has been chatter, as I'm sure many of you have seen if you're following the Facebook pages dedicated to this, that, you know, don't put profit before lives, which is obviously a logical sentiment. But the other aspect of this that the city is trying to point out is that having a commercial fishery is not just about whether people can make money or not, but it's about maintaining the food supply and having a flow of seafood to people who rely on it. So you think of it kind of in the same way as like the businesses that are stopping their regular production and converting to making ventilators or masks or or something like that, and in some cases not even charging for the distribution. The leading thought among the government officials is that the food supply, I mean, whether anybody made any money fishing or not, going out and catching the fish and making them part of the food chain is important to making sure that people around the world that rely on seafood don't starve don't don't lose their access to having seafood and that's not to say you know i'm not by pointing that out i'm not saying that that people that the profit over lives sentiment is is wrong it's just that there are more dimensions to this and and the city's point again is that we have an important role in the overall food supply for the world and that's why governments are hesitant to shut fisheries down and Even if the city wanted to, it can't. That would have to come from the state or from the Fed. So any of you that want to see that happen, that that still believe that shutting the fishery down is the best course of action, it sounds like you'll want to be lobbying state or federal officials instead of 
the city. Same thing with the airport. The city just doesn't have the legal authority to shut these things down. Moving on. Mutual aid agreements for fishermen. Per Cordova Emergency Order 2020-2, which, by the way, you can download and read from cityofcordova.net, all individual vessels and operators that want to enter Cordova's harbor must sign a mutual aid agreement which identifies the measures taken by the city as well as protections provided by the operator to prevent the spread of COVID-19 amidst the operator's employees and customers and within the Cordova community at large. It also binds the undersigned to agree to follow state and city mandates and orders including 14-day self-quarantine upon arrival and to take responsibility for their crew to do the same. These agreements will be available in their entirety on the city website Friday, April 3rd. That's today when we're rec- doing this show. So that should be up there with its appendix. The, the cover page and some instructions have been posted on the city website for a while, but uh, the, the hope is that the appendix will, will be up there because that's an important part of, you know, when you sign the form, you're supposed to have read and agreed to these things. So that, again, speaks to the concern about, you know, are people allowed to just come in and walk around and look for jobs and, and say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm part of the fishing industry, so I'm an essential worker and I can do what I want. It doesn't mean that at all, not even close. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some people, like we were talking about yesterday, that there aren't some people who either don't know or don't care and are going to do what they're going to do anyway, which is illegal. And you can be fined $25,000 and stuck in jail for up to a year for doing that. But it's like the analogy that we talked about between drunk driving. There are drunk driving laws and drunk driving punishments. People still do it. Same thing here. There are COVID-19 rules and laws and punishments Enforcement is doing everything that it possibly can, but really it relies on the individual uh, to make community-oriented choices. And I would say, too, that goes back to the importance of everybody that is in possession of this information and knows people who need to be in possession of this information. Make sure those people that need it get it. Contact them, call them, email them, Facebook them, whatever. Say, hey, if you're coming back, You need to know all of this because that is a very powerful way, I still insist, to cut down on the number of of people that will just be lollygagging because they don't know any better. And when you're talking about convincing somebody to do something, is a person more likely to accept that guidance from a friend or from, from a government official? I mean, there are plenty in Alaska or who spend a lot of time in Alaska who don't trust the government, don't like the government don't want to listen to the government. But if a friend is saying to them, you need to know this, you need to know this, you need to know this, or they're going to find you and they're going to put you in jail. And I don't want to see you find or end up in jail. So please read these documents and make sure you know all this stuff before you come here. That can be a real powerful way to get the word out on these things. The mutual aid agreements, by the way, are, like we said, at cityofcordova.net. Next item in the news release, Commercial Fishing Task Force. There are still many questions surrounding how to adequately communicate rules, protocols, best practices, and guidance to the broader fleet of commercial fishers who enter Cordova annually. For this reason, and to increase open two-way communication between those within Cordova's commercial fishery and the city on COVID-19 related issues, the city of Cordova's incident management team has established a commercial fishing task force comprised of fishing industry leaders from Cordova District Fishermen United, Copper River Prince William Sound Marketing Association, local processors, and Cordova citizens with knowledge and experience in the industry. And that group is going to begin their regular meetings next week. By the way, this would be a good time to reread. You know, we were talking about sharing information that you know with people who need to know it. If it helps to build some confidence, CDFU has on their COVID-19 page this statement. Fishermen returning to Cordova are expected to self-quarantine for 14 days upon arrival 
unless they have submitted a plan to the state of Alaska detailing how you will avoid the spread of COVID-19 and not endanger the lives of the communities in which you operate. Also not endanger the lives of others who serve as a part of that infrastructure or the ability of that critical infrastructure to function. The exemption, the one that designates fishing people participating in the fishery as, as essential workers, the exemption allows you to complete essential work during your quarantine period, but you must comply with the quarantine when not working. An exemption for work is not a blanket exemption, and you must continue to abide by social distancing guidelines. So like I've been saying, or my analogy has been, when you're on the clock, you have a certain amount of leeway. When you're not on the clock, an exemption as an essential worker doesn't mean anything. It doesn't give you privileges other than when you are actually engaged in work. That's an important thing to know. So again, if you want to read about the Commercial Fishing Task Force, this what, what I just said, uh, this news release is available for you to read at cityofcordova.net. Now, the section in the new news release about keeping Cordova informed. This is the part I'm excited about because we get to help with it. Daily radio updates. Mayor Clay Copeland and other members of the City of Cordova COVID-19 Incident Management Team will be hosting a daily COVID-19 radio update. This can be heard on KCDV and KLAM at 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m. every Monday through Friday. The short program will include frequently asked questions and answers, as well as pertinent local, state, and federal updates on COVID-19 status and planning. Archived radio updates will be available at youtube.com slash Cordova TV. Also, Frequently Asked Questions shows will be a weekly thing. A special FAQ session will be broadcast this Friday, April 3rd, that's today, with questions and answers, questions and answers, he tried to say, gathered from those sent to the Cordova Prepared at Yahoo.com email account. It will be aired at 5 p.m. on KLAM KCDV Radio and then also put on our YouTube channel. And it looks in here like maybe they're considering streaming that on the city channel as well. I hadn't heard about that, but we will see what they decide to do. But I know I know for sure that we're going to run it on the radio and also archive it on the Cordova TV YouTube channel. And what the FAQ is designed to be is a companion program to the weekly news briefings that the city has already been doing at 4 p.m. on Fridays. And those are streamed live and archived on the city's YouTube channel. These are the ones where you see video of Clay sitting in the city council chamber, Mayor Copeland, uh, reading out the latest information. And then what we're going to do is augment that with a question and answer session where the team, the incident management team, including Mayor Copeland, will begin delving into the questions that you've been sending in to that email address, which is the best thing to do with your questions, by the way, because those questions you email to CordovaPrepared at Yahoo.com get to the actual officials, and you'll get answers that aren't anecdotal or a guess, but you know, the, based on the best official information and science and, and so on. So that uh, is the end of the most recent news release. Again, you can download and read this at cityofcordova.net. We will have here on KLAM, and this will also be on KCDV, the briefing with the mayor. That's going to be a Monday through Friday thing, 1 p.m. hour, 5 p.m. hour, 8 p.m. hour. And then today on KLAM, actually, the special FAQ session with the full incident management team, that will preempt one of the reruns of the mayor's briefing on KLAM, but the short one will also be on KCDV. So today we have mayor's briefings and the special FAQ. And again, I'm really glad that we've gotten to a point where 
the station and the uh, city experts will begin to be able to partner in a way that gets you the most current information out on a regular basis. Touching quickly on different assets available to you, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention website on this is coronavirus.gov. The state page is coronavirus.alaska.gov, and that's where you can find all the health mandates and the frequently asked questions about them and all of the different documents. You know, the list of essential businesses and that that small community document that people have been interested in that, that where they'd like to see the city invoke that to cut down on people coming into town. And whether or not that can happen or not, it still is, is still probably in the hands of lawyers and legality and, and so forth. But that document is there if you want to read it because it's been cited and circulated by people who seem to have varying opinions on what it means. But hopefully that will get sorted out. But all those kinds of things are at coronavirus.alaska.gov. If you have non-clinical questions for the state, you can call 211. And then the local assets are at cityofcordova.net. All the news releases, the mutual aid agreements for fishermen, which should be complete today. All of the, the, that whole form should be up today. Then remember, cordovaprepared at yahoo.com if you have any questions. And that can be anything. You know, dear city, why aren't you closing the city? Why aren't you shutting everything down? Why aren't you uh, closing the fishery? Do I need to wear a mask? Uh, What's the safe thing for me to do in this situation? Am I allowed to stand out in my yard? You know, any of that kind of stuff. Cordova prepared at yahoo.com. Not only because they will reply to you with an answer, but also that's where we are going to be harvesting the questions that will get answered in our mayor's briefings and also the FAQ sessions on Friday. And I would point out again, people will sometimes say, well, why isn't open phones? Why isn't it open forum? You know, uh, why can't why why can't people talk in real time? The, the challenge with that is, is that you may not get the best or most accurate answer to your question. For the city to answer these questions, they have to be able to consider them, and doing that on the fly doesn't get you the best information. So that's why it's been largely deemed, and I agree, really. I mean, I've, I've been a host of, of open phones programs for almost 30 years, and I, I've been able to analyze the, the costs and benefits and the good and bad points, pros and cons, but um, in this situation where, where accurate information Getting accurate information out and reducing speculation, I, I'm inclined to agree with that approach, that anything you want to know about, send it to cordovaprepared at yahoo.com, and that's where the questions that get answered in these special programs with the city will be harvested from. Now, that's not to say that if you have an opinion or something that you'd like shared on this program that you can't reach out to us. Uh, If you want to write up something that you'd like me to read on one of these shows, if you'd like to make a recording of yourself making a statement, anybody with with a cell phone and a Facebook account can do that now, actually very easily. Facebook Messenger gives you the ability to make audio recordings of yourself right there, and then you could message that over to us here. And, and, you know, so if you've got something to say, and I want to cite, like, for example, Luke Bohr and C1 Gelbach uh, offered testimony at the last council meeting, and it sounded very good. The audio quality was good. The content was good. Uh, It was interesting, if not possibly actionable, but, I mean, it was at least interesting to hear what they had to say. And, And if you want us to to share information, we're certainly happy to receive it. So keep that in mind. Now let's talk about masks here for a sec. Because, and now we're off of the official city positions on things. I don't know if the city's taken a position on this or not. So we're moving into uh, more of a state and national conversation about masks because there's been... Uh, Actually, at the CDC level, there have been a number of reports that they are taking a look 
In fact, I think the Surgeon General made the rounds of national media yesterday saying, yeah, you know, we're rethinking this some, and uh, that maybe masks do have a role to play out in public. Now, this is another one of these things that kind of has to be understood from the perspective of what did we know and when we knew it, and how did we think people were going to react? You know, this is the, the medical people and the government officials. When the pandemic first started, the concern was, and it ended up being justified, that there would be a run on masks if, if they just instantly said, yeah, everybody should wear masks because it seems like a good idea that there would be a run on masks and there wouldn't be any left for the medical uh, professionals, which, of course, happened. And these are these, what are they, N95, the, the, the fancy masks that, that are needed most by the medical personnel that are on the front line. I mean, you've heard the stories. People were buying them. They were panic buying them for themselves and some jerks, even one in Alaska. I saw a story about somebody in Alaska that went and bought, went to a Lowe's and bought like 239 20-packs of these good quality masks and was trying to price gouge sell them on eBay and Amazon. And I mean, if you ever wanted to punch somebody in the face, well, you can't punch them in the face, so get a six-foot pole and whack them over the head. What a butthead, but sorry, that's an opinion. That's not official. So the officials were worried about that, and they also were worried that people would think that if they wore masks, they were protecting themselves from catching the virus. So that's what all of the initial, when they were first considering this idea, that's what the initial focus was on. First of all, masks will not prevent you from catching it to a great degree. It provides some protection, but it it in no way makes you immune from being able to catch it. And... People will go on a rampaging buy, and there won't be any left for the doctors. That's how it started. What's happened as the situation has evolved is the experts are hearing and realizing that while a mask may not prevent a person from catching the virus, they can be very effective in preventing people from giving the virus to others. So in other words, the mask doesn't necessarily help the wearer, but it helps the wearer prevent spreading it to other people, which is very valuable when you're trying to tamp down and flatten the curve and so on. Also, having a mask has a tendency to cause somebody to not touch their face. It's just sort of an instinct when you're not wearing a mask to reach up and scratch or touch your mouth or whatever. When you have a mask on, that's more difficult. It, it's, it's like a, a, a subconscious reminder to not do that. So because of those benefits, slowing the spread and keeping people from touching their noses and faces, the CDC is shifting its position on that. And state officials in, 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 in the larger communities, people in Anchorage, people in Fairbanks, and I'm sure this is going to spread around, are falling in line with that and saying, no, you know, there actually there, there is a benefit for people to wear masks out in public. But that comes with a very important caveat, and this is the thing that I like to emphasize when I'm having dialogue with people about the validity of masks. Something that is very, 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 and also very important. Any of us that wear masks out in public need to be absolutely sure that we don't in any way relax our adherence to social distancing guidelines and staying at home. And this is another thing that that the officials have been concerned about from the beginning and continue to remain concerned about is that people will say, oh, I have a mask on. That means I can go out in public more often. I don't have to worry about staying at home. I don't have to worry about social distancing because I have a a, a, a mask on. No, absolutely no wrong, uh-uh. If, if people are going to add masks to their protection regimen, the guidance from the experts is, in essence, don't change, in, in, do, do things the way you would do if you weren't wearing a mask. Don't change anything about what you're doing 
if you didn't have a mask. Do everything precisely the same way and add the mask as icing on the cake. Don't have any temptation to feel more confident and behave differently because you have a mask. Because if people start doing that, then the curve is not going to flatten and everything's going to get screwed up. So if you weren't going to go to the store before a recommendation to wear masks, don't decide to start going to the store after the recommendation to wear masks. But if you absolutely must go out for a critical need and you're going to be around anybody, wear the mask, whether you're sick or not, to protect other people because people can be sick with this virus and can be spreading it around but not showing any symptoms. You can feel, and That's another reason, by the way, the CDC is changing its guidelines. They're realizing, you know, we can keep asymptomatic people from spreading this around through air transmission by having everyone use masks when they have to be out in public. You know, so a perfect example of using masks, a a, a time and place to use masks, would be if you're going to that Cordova school the the Tuesday where the schools put out the food. I'm sure you've heard about that program if if you need it, and if not, it's detailed on cordovasd.org, the school website, where since they obviously can't serve in the cafeteria because there's no school, what they've been doing is putting together meal packs and the pickups are on Tuesday. That would be an excellent place for you to use a homemade mask. And by the way, a lot of this guidance is for the homemade masks, not again to start a run on on the good masks that the medical people need, but for people to make their own and use those. And even, you know, a bandana around the face is better than nothing. Again, not to it's not going to necessarily protect you from catching it, but if you've got the virus, it'll help to keep you from spreading it to others. That's the goal. So it would arguably be a good idea when you go to pick up those food packets at the school, primarily to maintain the social distancing, as always. But in addition to that, maybe make up some kind of a mask and and use that. Because it just adds one extra thing that we can do. There's some rumors that they're considering uh, requiring masking at the national level, but that's all it is really is is rumors. They they could at some point, uh, particularly if things get a lot worse, put out a a requirement on that. But for right now, it's it's just uh, guidance that's starting to take shape at the CDC. And really, when you think of it, 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 it can't hurt anything. Now, in order to use homemade masks right, it can create some problems if you, uh, for example, when you get home, you, uh, you touch the mask as you're taking it off and then to wash your hands. And uh, laundering these things seems to be a good idea. But, boy, there's a lot of great guidance out there on, uh, on how to make and use these patterns and fabric ideas and you know, if and even if you don't sew, there are there are options for using. You know, some of them involve something as simple as a as t-shirt material and hair ties to loop around your ears. So, you know, you don't have to be an expert sewer to be able to participate in this. Again, though, and I know I'm being redundant. The bottom line is is that adding masks to the mix of mitigation measures will not help if people start feeling empowered to be more reckless with with social distancing and staying at home. Don't change any of that. Do all of that the same way you would as if nobody ever said wear a mask. But those times that you do need to be out for critical needs, the guidance is moving towards saying, yeah, go ahead, use a mask because it'll keep you from getting a, a giving it to, uh, I mean, not 100%, but it'll help prevent giving it to other people. By the way, speaking of... Uh, peer-to-peer guidance on stuff. I've really been enjoying seeing some some of the uh, ideas that locals have been sharing. 
uh, either in text or even sometimes video. How about Jason, Jason Palace's video, which I mention not only because it was fun to watch, but because while he was driving around in his truck, he was listening to 100.9 The Eagle. Can I get an amen for that good behavior? <laughs> yeah! Listening to The Eagle, making the community safer. But that stuff, those ideas that he had were, were, were cool. Um, I saw another interesting one, and, and again, this is anecdotal. This is not city, not CDC, just, just something interesting to consider. Because uh, there are people who uh, also want to use gloves while they're out in public. That's one of the things that, that Jason's video talked about and, you know, other articles and so forth is if you, if you have to go to the store. Well, first off, taking delivery from the store is absolutely the best way to prevent the spread. And hats off to all of our, you know, not just groceries, but, but all of our retailers moving toward that model. Please don't come in. Let us bring the stuff out to you. Let us shop for you and bring it out. Or in some cases, deliver it. But if you're in a situation where you have to be out somewhere and you want to use gloves, I saw one interesting thought, and it was from a, either a nurse or a doctor, about using not two gloves, but one. And the reason is, is that if you're using two gloves, say you are... Say you had to be in a store and you were, you were touching things that had been touched by other people and you were picking up the virus because you were touching things. Well, that virus would be on your gloves. And if you reach for your credit card or your keys or anything like that, you would be transmitting that virus on your gloves to yourself. So what this person was saying as an idea is wear one glove, touch things that are... Uh, not your personal stuff with your glove and handle your stuff like your keys, your wallet, your credit card and everything with your ungloved hand. So you remember, okay, I use this hand to handle things that might have virus on them while I use my ungloved hand to handle my own personal property. And it would serve, they thought that it would serve as a, as a possible reminder. Now, again, that's just a thought, something for someone to contemplate. It's not any sort of official guidance. But the, the point is, is that it's been interesting to see people getting creative. There was one doctor somewhere who had a whole video on how to safely and virus-free unpack your grocery bags. And as we wrap it up here, uh, one final thought for the weekend and this is uh, not anecdotal, but actually based in science. Just something to consider. And I mention it because Sound Alternatives put out a uh, recommendation. I'm trying to see if I still have the paperwork. Here it is. Um, no, I'm sorry. It came out from the Cordova Family Resource Center on taking care of your emotional health. Self-care is extremely important when dealing with this current outbreak. And it's okay to feel stress, angry, anxious, or grief during a time like this. Self-isolation doesn't have to be as bad as it sounds, though, and by doing your part, you're helping those in your community. They recommend the steps uh, to avoid being overly stressed. You can de-stress by staying connected electronically, you know, FaceTime with people, Skype, whatever you use. Be sure to take breaks. Be sure to eat healthy, well-balanced meals. Get some exercise in there and stay informed by trustworthy sources. Remember, too, that it's okay for your exercise to be out in the fresh air as long as you are keeping your distance from people. That's, that's, there's a provision for that in all the mandates. And if you feel guilty walking around where you might interact with somebody else, even just some time in your yard, get some fresh air, walk around a little bit. But uh, it, along with this, it's a good idea to remember how important it is to not overstress yourself because if you are in a consistent state of stress or fear, you're compromising your immune system. You're actually, if, if, if you're worrying to the point that you're jacked up all the time, you are actually increasing the chances that you will get sick 
from this virus. Which is not to say people should just abandon being concerned, you know, and and uh, and not pursue their goals of helping the community or, uh, you know, pursuing legal remedies for things that that worry them or any of that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that you just that you just do nothing, but you got to find a balance in there. Be sure, you know, if you have to push during some portions of the day, back off in other portions of the day through meditation, through prayer, through relaxing and disconnecting some. Because again, if you're in this heightened state of arousal all the time, it's it's not even a matter that's up for debate. Any doctor will tell you you're compromising your immune system. You're lowering your ability to ward off the disease. And if you get the virus, you're warding off your body's ability to fight it if you're in a constant state of, of agitation. So that's good, solid scientific guidance to keep in mind, and I hope that uh, it'll enable people to think about the importance of getting some chill-out time in there. Okay, this has gone on long enough, I think, so we'll call it good. We'll see you again here, I hope, at 1.00. For the first playing of the mayor's briefing, which will be a weekday thing, 1 p.m. hour, 5 p.m. hour, 8 p.m. hour, Monday through Friday on KLAM and KCDV. Also today at 5, we will have the FAQ program with the full incident man. Well, not the full team, but but like the heads of the incident management team. That's at 5 p.m. on the radio. At 4 p.m. on the city's YouTube channel will be the mayor's briefing to the community, and then we'll do our thing at 5. And all of the stuff, this show, mayor's briefings, FAQs with the city, and even the the 4 p.m. briefings with the city, we are capturing those and putting them on our YouTube channel in addition to the city having them on there. So, you know, with our stuff, you can kind of have it all in one place. And, and all, of, all of our special programming having to do with this subject is archived on our channel, youtube.com slash Cordova TV. If you ever forget the name, remember we've been using Cordova Radio to refer to our operation. Robbie thought, well, if I'm going to create a TV channel, let's call it Cordova TV. So that's what it is. youtube.com slash Cordova TV to hear our archive at your leisure on any device of your choosing. Big thanks to Cordova Wireless Communications for being a very generous sponsor of local radio for many, many years. They're the reason we're able to have a regular talk show available through their sponsorship. And we will get you all of the features that were missed in the 10 a.m. hour to make way for this show. The town meeting program on KLAM. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at one for the mayor's briefing.